Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the laureate of the 2018 Ten Prize in Rule of Law, Joseph Raz, and our guests, Professor Su Yongqing, Professor Dai Hua, Professor Xie Shiming, and the President of National Chenji University, Edward Zhou. Welcome. Good afternoon, distinguished guests. Thank you all for joining us today here at the Master's Forum of the 2018 Ten Prize in Rule of Law. We would now like to invite the President of National Chenji University, Edward Zhou, to give us the opening remark. President Zhou. Uh, Professor Raz, uh, Mrs. Raz, and Nong, and uh, uh, Ding Wang, Professor Su, Professor Dai, and Professor Xie, and my uh, colleagues and friends at National Change University and students. How are you doing? Okay, great. <laughs> okay, uh, National Change University is very honored to have uh, Professor Raz visiting us today. And according to uh, Mrs. Raz, and this is their first visit in Taiwan. So we are very grateful the Town Price Foundation and Mr. Ying, who, who established the Town Price Foundation for making the arrangement for Professor Raz to visit us today. And Professor Raz uh, is a, a very distinguished uh, legal scholar and philosopher uh, in the field of uh, um, legal, moral, and political philosophy. And I'm not uh, in this field, so I cannot say too much uh, how much he has accomplished. But, but according to the information I have in hand, I can tell that he has tremendous influence uh, in his fields. And he's both a, uh, a legal scholar and a philosopher. And what he has written uh, in his books and he, in his uh, scholarly uh, publications uh, have uh, provoked uh, Many, many new ideas and thinkings uh, in the legal um, uh, um, and the philosophical areas. And um, Professor uh, Ross, actually now um, from 2006 and 2009, he served as a research professor at the University of Oxford. And he was named the British Hispanic professor at uh, Complutense University in Madrid in 2007 and from 1985 to 2006. And Professor Ross was both a professor of the philosophy of law at Oxford, uh, as well as a fellow of uh, Balliol College. He now uh, is with um, Columbia University as a um, chair professor there. And he published many, many books, as I said earlier, that has tremendous uh, uh, influence. Uh, uh, one of them is called The Morality of Freedom. And um, Professor Dai actually uh, shared with me just earlier that this is a wonderful book, and he's going to talk about that in his uh, comments later. Professor Ross uh, uh, obtained uh, his doctorate degree, doctorate degree uh, of philosophy from uh, Oxford and a uh, magister juris from uh, Hebrew University. And I think you know, he also feel very honored that uh, he later on uh, was awarded um, an honorary, honorary doctorate degree by uh, Hebrew University where he studied uh, um, uh, earlier. Uh, I just want to say that uh, this is tremendous um, honor for NCCU to have you. And I just hope that after today, you will um, come back again, uh, not just to NCCU, but to visit National Palace Museum. Okay. And I have discussed with uh, Dean Wang to see if it's possible um, to invite you uh, back to NCCU often in the future. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Professor President Zhou. Please kindly take your seat. Now, let us welcome the panel of this forum to the stage. Professor Raz, Professor Su, Professor Dai, and Professor Xie. Please, welcome to the, welcome to the, to the stage.
Professor Su, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Professor Ras, uh, Mrs. Ras, and uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is uh, my great honor and pleasure to moderate the following part of the forum. Uh, this is uh, the, the third term of Tom Price uh, in Rule of Law Laureate, uh, Laureate uh, Professor uh, Joseph Rass. I think uh, I'll begin with a short introduction and then uh, we'll have uh, two uh, discussions, Professor Dai and Professor Xie, uh, to make some uh, remarks on uh, your work. The 2018 Town Prize in Rule of Law is awarded to Joseph Rass, one of the foremost legal philosophers of our time for his path-breaking contributions to the rule of law and for deepening out understanding of the very nature of the law, legal reasoning, and the relationship between law, morality, and freedom. Uh, this is the overall uh, evaluation of uh, his uh, contributions to rule of law made by uh, the Tom Price. Uh, in the following, uh, we'll have uh, Professor Dai Hua. Uh, he is uh, chair professor of National Zhongzhen University uh, faculty and uh, uh, college of philosophy. Uh, he'll make some uh, remarks to your great uh, work, uh, Morality of Freedom. I think it will be about 15 minutes to 20 minutes, and followed by Professor uh, Xie Shimin, also a philosopher, a, a professor of uh, uh, College of Philosophy in uh, National Zhongzhen University. And he will make some uh, response to your great lecture on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, the, the prize awarding uh, ceremony. The virtual law as a virtual. Yes. Please, uh, Professor Dai. Professor uh, Raz and Professor Su. And um, I feel greatly honored uh, to be able to, uh, to uh, talk as a, one of the discussants uh, for this uh, wonderful occasion. Uh, Professor Joseph Ross has made many, uh, as you know, uh, many significant contributions in a wide range of disciplines in humanities and social sciences, um, including jurisprudence, political science, theory of value and practical reason, and moral and political philosophy. Um, but today I will, as someone whose specialties are in philosophy, confine myself to introducing and commenting on Professor Raz's defense, his well-known view about personal uh, autonomy as a core ideal of liberalism, especially as this view is expounded in his highly con influential and original book, The Morality of Freedom, uh, first published in 1986. Uh, let me begin by observing that the notion of personal autonomy has played a foundational role in a number of liberal theories of justice, the most prominent among which are, uh, I would say, the two put forward respectively by John Rawls and Ronald Dorkin. But as pointed out by uh, Gerald Dorkin, another famous Dorkin, uh, personal autonomy has been understood in different ways uh, by different authors. And what's important for us when considering their theories is first to get hold of exactly how each author conceives it, and then to tell whether personal autonomy is really something sh that we should regard as valuable in a way that is proper for its role as a cornerstone of the, the author's theory. Now, Professor Ross speaks of uh, the ideal of autonomy as the ideal 
of the uh, autonomous life to be led by a person. Personal autonomy is for him primarily, uh, if I'm right, something uh, to be attached to a person's life, uh, brought about and lived by her in certain ways. Professor Ross distinguishes the word autonomy as he uses it in this sense from another sense, which he takes to be secondary, in which it refers to the capacity for autonomy, or more precisely, the capacity for leading an autonomous life. Autonomy in this secondary sense is significantly also referred to by Professor Ross as the conditions of autonomy, or I take it, conditions that are conducive to leading an autonomous life. Let me now explain what these uh, conditions are. Uh, and in what follows, I will quote uh, many passages from the uh, morality of freedom. Uh, to save time, I will skip the uh, quote and unquote. Uh, according to Professor Ross, the conditions of autonomy are, are complex and consist of three distinct components. First, appropriate mental abilities, uh, which include minimum rationality, the ability to comprehend the means required to realize one's goals, the mental faculties necessary to plan actions, etc. Then second, an adequate, and this is important, an adequate range of options or choices for an autonom autonomous life. And finally, third, independence, i.e. Uh, freedom from coercion and manipulation by others. Now, Professor Ross holds that these three conditions can be satisfied more or less or to different degrees. Uh, I will, in what follows, focus on the second condition, an adequate range of options. Uh, for Professor Ross, the second condition is, strictly speaking, an adequate range, not of any options, but only of, quote and unquote, morally acceptable ones. Thus, for him, autonomy as capacity requires that many morally acceptable options be available to a person, or requires a choice of good, or a choice of good rather than bad, evil, or morally repugnant things. In a word, uh, for Professor Ross, autonomy as capacity should aim at the good or is valuable only if exercised in pursuit of the good. In this way, I think, uh, Professor Ross actually ties autonomy necessarily to the pursuit of a good life or a person's well-being. Now, at least three thought-provoking views may result from Professor Ross's position sketched above on autonomy. First, as he points out, some of the philosophers theorizing about uh, autonomy would maintain that, and I quote here, all value derives from choice, which is itself not guided, not guided by value, and is therefore free, uh, uh, that is, arbitrary. For Professor Ross, his position on uh, autonomy neither derives from nor supports any such view. On the contrary, his position presupposes independently existing values which are transformed and added to by the development of one's projects and commitments made from a range of valuable or morally acceptable options or choices. Relatedly, it follows from, from Professor Ross's position on autonomy, and he thinks our common sense intuitions would also concur that autonomy should be used for the good, so that it would not have any value qua autonomy when it is abused or misused. If so, then it also follows that, and this is very interesting uh, to me at least, an autonomous wrongdoer is morally worse than a non-autonomous wrongdoer. Uh, this is so because uh, for Professor Ross, the former, the autonomous wrongdoer, abuses his autonomy 
or those uh, uh, abilities that are part of his autonomy as capacity. This claim is crucial for Professor Ross, and is it is worth, I think, testing it uh, against our intuitions. For example, one might think that it is the non-autonomous wrongdoer rather than the autonomous wrongdoer that is morally, morally worse, because the former has failed to develop, whereas the latter did develop autonomy as a valuable uh, capacity. I'm here only suggesting how to think about the issue. Uh, we may have to weigh value, uh, failure in developing autonomy against abuse of it and decide which is morally worse. Second, if a government, for uh, Professor Ross, is, as it is for uh, liberals, to promote autonomy, it should be, on Professor Ross's account, permissible for the, the government to foster a social environment or a collective good, as he calls it, that makes available to its citizens an adequate range of only those options that are valuable or morally acceptable. This makes Professor Ross a so-called perfectionist liberal, as opposed to what may be called uh, neutralist liberals, such as John Ross and Ronald Dworkin. In the morality of freedom, Professor Ross admirably uh, advanced his perfectionist liberalism against the current at, at a time when Ross and Dworkin had been arguing that um, in the face of, to borrow Ross's expression, in the face of a diversity of conflicting and even incommensurable conceptions of the meaning, value, and purpose of human life, Reasons for governmental action should be neutral. That is, should not favor any such conception of the good life over others. However, neutralist or anti-perfectionist liberals seem to run into blatant contradiction insofar as they seem to be committed to the following uh, two claims, which I borrow from uh, Ben Coburn uh, in a uh, 2010 article in the journal Analysis, two claims. First, uh, simply, the state ought to promote autonomy. The second claim is that the state ought not in its action to promote any value. These two claims would be contradictory if the term any value in the second claim was to refer to values that include autonomy itself. But Professor Ross uh, has, in fact, a way to rescue the anti-perfectionist from this apparent uh, contradiction. For him, and this is the third thought-provoking view that I would like to highlight, we must distinguish between the adequate range of valuable options on the one hand and autonomy on the other. For Professor Ross, what any value in the second claim refers to should be whatever valuable options are included in the adequate range, but not autonomy itself. For the latter gives what we may call the form in which some options or other in the adequate range take shape and are materialized by a person's autonomous life. To this extent, autonomy may be called, in Coburn's term, a second order value. And those valuable options in an adequate range first order values. Uh, let us call autonomy, uh, the second order value, the arc value, the chief value, to which the first order values give substance. Now, even though the anti-perfectionist can consistently maintain both one and two, understood in terms of Professor Ross's distinction, they will understand the arc of value, humanity, uh, autonomy, referred to in one differently than Professor Ross does. The chief difference between uh, be, uh, being that whereas autonomy as they, the neutralist, conceive it, um, is neutral to the good, the, the opposite holds true for Professor Ross. Thus, as far as I can see, the plausibility of Professor Ross's political perfectionism in a liberal society 
turns on two questions. First, whether his conception of autonomy is more defensible than the neutralist uh, uh, conception or conceptions. And second, whether he can convince us that autonomy as he understands it should be considered valuable as an arc value. Professor Ross seems to be dealing with the second question in section three, uh, uh, headed the value of autonomy in chapter 14 of the morality of freedom. But it also seems to me that what he says in sec uh, subsection 2.3, uh, headed creating value uh, in the chapter, already gives at least an, a very important part of his answer to it. The thrust of what he holds in subsection 2.3 may be summed up by the following uh, very memorable remark, I think, he makes about autonomy as a capacity for self-creation. Uh, and I quote, in embracing goals and commitments, in coming to care about one thing or another, one progressively gives shapes to one's life, determines what would count as a successful life and what would be a failure. One creates values, generates through one's developing um, commitments and pursuits, reasons which transcend the reasons one had in the past for undertaking one's commitments and pursuits. In that way, a person's life is in part of his own making. Uh, incidentally, incidentally um, Professor Ross's expression, life of one's own making, may remind one of the Kant scholar Christine Korsgaard's uh, 2009 book titled Self-Constitution. At the risk now uh, of stretching uh, Professor Ross's point too far, I would suggest that his remark just cited sounds very Kantian. For the picture it puts before us of someone making his or her own life um, is analogous with and even very helpfully illuminates Kant's idea that all normal human beings have uh, so-called rational nature, which Kant also calls humanity, uh, a technical term he uses for it, as a capacity for setting ends to oneself, thereby uh, creating values for oneself, as Professor Ross would put it, and subsequently executing effective means to them. And that, regardless of whether this capacity is in yourself or in other rational beings, it is an objective end, an end in itself, which ought morally to be respected by everyone, the agent herself included. For Kant, we are morally obligated to assist others in developing their rational nature and using it to achieve the end we, uh, they set to themselves insofar as its use does not violate moral demands. Thank you. Um, it's a great honor to be here. Um, let me uh, begin by saying, um, Professor Rod's Tang Prize Laureate lecture is timely for Taiwan. Uh, in the past two years, our legislature has passed several controversial acts, such as the act governing the settlement of ill garden properties by political parties and their affiliate organizations, which was passed in the year 2016 act on promoting traditional justice and so-called pension reform acts for military personnel, civil servants, and teachers. One criticism of these acts, made especially by those who would be consequentially disadvantaged, is that these acts violate the rule of law. Of course, the government denies the judge, all of these judges. Um, the debate between both sides is still going on. Although Professor Roth's lecture does not address the practical issues, it does provide a very helpful conceptual framework for us to reflect on and debate about the rule of law in Taiwan, as well as about what the rule of law is in theory. 
Since Professor Ross is new to Taiwan, I shall now ask him about what he thinks about these controversial acts in terms of the account of rule of law he put forward in his Tang Price Laureate lecture. Please don't ask him. <laughs> but uh, now that we have heard Professor Ross's account, I believe that we will benefit from it in improving our understanding of the uh, controversy caused by these acts. If we could have Professor Ross talk more, clarify further about his account of the rule of law today. And that's what I'm going to do in the follows. For Professor Ross, um, the rule of law is a political ideal. It consists of a list of yet to be specified the principles that apply to government and to the law. A successful account of the rule of law must answer at least two questions. One, of what principles does the rule of law consist, such that they are the principles of the rule of law, rather than of something else? Second, why is the rule of law important? Or what values does the rule of law serve? And perhaps how important is the value of the rule of law relative to other values? Um, in his seminal paper, The Rule of Law and Its Virtue, which was published in 1977, Professor Ross attempted to give us a successful account of the rule of law. He suggests the rule of law at the least consists of A principles. One, law should be prospective, open and clear, to relatively um, stable, Three, the making of particular laws should be guided by open, stable, clear, and general rules. Fourth, the independence of the judiciary. Five, the principle of natural justice should be, um, should be upheld. Um, judicial review of the implementation, access, uh, accessible courts for all, and, and lastly, no perversion of the law by prosecutorial or policing discretion. And these eight principles are now well known, and um, I would say it's very influential. And basically, it's a starting point for people who care about the rule of law to start with. The basic idea he employed to unify uh, these eight principles of the rule of law is that I quote, Law must be capable of guiding the behavior of the subject. Okay, that's the single simple idea that sort of unify the uh, A principles that I listed above. And I think that's the beauty of his uh, 1977 paper. It's a very simple idea and generate you know, a, a set of principles that are quite substantial, I would say. The value of the rule of law can serve include, according to Professor Ratz, to avoid arbitrary government, that's number one. Number two, to protect individual freedom, and lastly, to respect human dignity. Okay, the importance of rule of law, at the least, has three. In his laureate lecture, Professor Ratz now takes the aim of avoiding arbitrary government to be a basic idea, too. What I'm saying is that in 1977, he has one basic idea. Now he seems to have two. One is, again, you know, um, to, to be able to guide uh, the behavior of its subject. And now the new idea is to avoid uh, arbitrary government. Um, and he used it, along with the old one, um, to argue that the rule of law at the list consists of a list of 11 principles. Now, you know. The principle grows, right? You know, you have new ideas, the principle goes. Um, oh, there are some overlap between uh, these two sets. So let me read the 11 principles, okay? One, all laws should be reasonably clear, reasonably stable, publicly available, general rules and standards that are applied prospectively and not retroactively. Okay, and this 
here you have five principles, and some of them overlap with the, uh, the, uh, the previous set. Six, the reason for which government decisions are made should be publicly declared. Seven, the process of reaching the decision should be fair and unbiased. Eight, and it should allow proper opportunities to consider relevant arguments and information. You know, various degree of representation and hearing are involved. Nine, the decision should be reasonable relative to their declared reasons. 10, following presumptive convention for showing manifest intention to serve the interest of the governed. Okay, this is principle number 10, I think it's very interesting. And it's something really new. Um, Professor Ross put um, on the list of the principles of the rule of law. 11. The doctrine of the rule of law and its main implication should be part of the public culture embedded in education and public discourse and taken as obvious and vital by all. Okay, these are 11 principles that Professor Ross talked about the other day when he gave this laureate lecture. One interesting question that I believe many people uh, would like to ask Professor Ross is about the extent to which his laureate lecture differ from the rule of law and its, vir and its virtue. You know, whether he changed his mind, you know, or he just didn't change his mind, just mod modified it a bit, adding something. Um, they might want to know whether he has made any significant change regarding his account of the rule of law, and if so, why he made such changes. It seems to me, that's my observation, he needs to make changes mainly because the A principles he put forward in the earlier paper cannot solve the four problems he lists in his laureate lecture. More specifically, he thinks they cannot, or they are not able to eliminate the possibility of arbitrary government. And that's the crucial thing. But he thinks that the one aim of the rule of law is to avoid arbitrary government. You know, the, the, the sort of the deficiency of his brief account of rule of law is that it's not able to avoid, you know, one of the sort of main uh, the aim of the rule of law, which is to avoid arbitrary government. So he put the so the idea of avoiding arbitrary government into now the base of the rule of law. It's one of the basic ideas. Uh, for Professor Roth, it is clear case of arbitrary government if the government promotes its own interest rather than the interest of the governed. Okay, his take of what arbitrary government means, basically. You know, it's a clear case if the government promotes its own interest rather than the interest of the governed. And he suggests that conformity to the rule of law hence require the government of the list to act with manifest intention to serve the interest of the governed. And based on this idea, Professor Ross argued that conformity to the rule of law require the government to conform to principle number six to 11 in this decision, as well as in making, applying, and developing its laws. Um, all right, so, so here's, uh, so, so that, that's the difference I see and, and the reason why uh, Professor Ross changed his account. One worry I have about this way of revising his brief account of the rule of law is that once we take the value of rule of law may serve, in this case, to avoid ar arbitrary government, to be a unified element of the rule of law, we risk of opening the door for considering other values as well. For example, the value of protecting individual freedom and the value of respecting human dignity. These two values that Professor Ross in the previous paper uh, argued that the rule of law can, can serve. So once you put avoiding arbitrary government you know, into the base, then why not you put the other two values into the base too? Um, we may ask, on what grounds are we to stop these two values from playing a role in determining the principle of the rule of law. Can't we say that also belong to the realm of public interest? It seems that those who think 
the rule of law must protect human rights, my ad. The conformity to the law is acting with manifest intention to protect human rights of the governed. So this is a parallel to Rod's point. You know, the government has to, in order not to be arbitrary, to show manifest intention that their actions are to serve the public interest. And more important, I think one might challenge Professor Rod's by offering the following proposal as as an alternative to his new account. That obeying the law in the sense of coercive power being exercised by government in accordance with publicly declared standards established in the right, I'm sorry, public standards established in the right way before they exist. Uh, this is a quote from Ronald Wilkins' 2006 book. This idea, obeying the law, exhausts the idea of non-arbitrary government. Okay, and this is in contrast to uh, Professor Ross's idea, promoting the public interest is the non-arbitrary government. Here, the working is saying is, you know, obeying the law itself um, uh, is non-arbitrary government. So there's a difference. Um, so, according to this alternative, whether the government is pursuing the public interest in its activity is always the business of politics. You know, we may, dis we may dispute about that. People disagree on whether you know, a particular act by government is pursuing the public interest. And as long as the government does not disobey the law, that is not the concern of the rule of law. You know, as long as government obey the law and, and, you know, and the politics of ordinary life uh, will be about what counts as public, in public interest and how to properly pursue them. Instead, rule of law requires, according to this, this alternative, the government to correctly identify what the law is in order to obey the law. And observing to the presumptive presumptive con convention described in Principle 10 is meant to show the government's intention to identify correctly what the law is, um, what the rest of the principle of the rule of laws are, as well as to obey the law. Uh, it seems to me that Professor Rod's way of modifying his account of rule of law might animate several alternative accounts of rule of law with, I would say, equal conceptual clarity as his. And I think the last thought I have, I have is um, probably the account that you gave in 1977 is a better one. It's very thin, you know, very simple and powerful. Uh, the idea of avoiding, the value of avoiding arbitrary government is something that the, the rule of law can serve, but itself is not or should not be part of the base of the rule of law. Um, the idea of non-arbitrary government as pursuing public interest can stay where it is. Um, as one value that the rule of law uh, can serve. Um, and, um, and principles about you know, um, public accountability that you, you list um, from six to 11 uh, can be explained and defended without that idea of pursuing public interest. Thank you. So first let me thank both of you for such a clear and succinct uh, explanation of my views. That, that's not the only thing you did, but um, it was to my, to me, quite remarkably, remarkable that you did that, and especially your talk, which reacquainted me <laughs> with uh, an old friend, a book which I wrote 30 years ago. Um, so, so I was very, very pleased to meet it again <laughs> through you. Um, so I will uh, try to uh, pick up, I, I will go 
in your, does it is, I'll start with commenting on your paper and, and then proceed to the rule of law issue. Um, now, the, uh, but I'll pick up points, not necessarily in the order in which you uh, discussed them. So the first point is the point um, of people, of there being values which are independently of people's choices and preferences, express preferences, and which a view about what those values are guides people's choices. <clears throat> And that is a, a very fundamental view, I'm afraid. It's not mine. I wish it were. Uh, it goes back to Aristotle. It was endorsed by Aquinas uh, and has been alive, not without challenges, uh, ever since. And to my mind, the um, point behind it is very simple. We do sometimes act, I mean, just to be crude about it, like robots. Uh, we have knee jerks, and we have more kind of metaphorical knee jerks, not literal knee jerks. Uh, events in the world, thoughts in us sometimes trigger a reaction which just explodes out of us like an e-jerk does without any um, reflection or control by us. So there's no doubt that there are such cases. Um, some people might like the way they behave in that way. They might kind of look at themselves as it were from the outside, when they look at themselves from the outside and they see those robotic reactions that they manifest, they say, gosh, isn't that beautiful? Most of us don't. Most of us think that what matters most in our life are other occasions which also exist and to my mind are much more numerous in which, in, in which occasions we have some idea of something which makes some action worth doing, like I have already sipped water several times uh, by listening to my colleague. So in each time I had the idea that it would be nice to have a sip of water. And because I thought that it would be a good something worth doing to have the sip of water, I went ahead and did it. So these are trivial examples, but I think they start from there and they go to the most fundamental aspects of our life. We are students. We decide to go to school for a variety of reasons. One of them is that it might be actually worth doing, it might satisfy interests that we have, provide us with qualifications which will stand us in good stead in life, even though we don't know how. We don't have, sometimes people have ideas how they will use the qualification they will gain in their study. But most often, including myself, I didn't have any idea. I just thought, well, it would be good to have that and I will be able to think about something useful. <laughs> to do with my qualifications. So it seems to me that uh, informing intentions, informing wishes and desires, we are guided by thoughts that something appeals and appeals not to us as robots triggered by some stimulus, but appeals to us as thinking beings who see how that thing can integrate with other things and contribute to us in one way or another. 
sometimes, as I tended to emphasize in that book, uh, to make our life more successful, more worthwhile. Uh, I'm now much more aware of more fragmentation and how much that we do it doesn't actually affect the quality of my life, like the numbers of si sips of water that I'm going to take during this event is not going to affect the quality of my life very much, but each one of them has a little point to be said for it. Otherwise, so that's a way of understanding a lot of our psychology, that's a way of understanding how we understand our psychology, and it leads to a certain view about what we value about ourselves and about our lives, that we value the fact that we are able to have an impact on ourselves and on the world, sometimes towards changing it, sometimes towards pre preventing changes, which we think would be undesirable, and that we build our lives by uh, using those capacities. And the use of those capacities, and success of the use of those capacities is one of the most important thing in our own estimation of the quality of our life. So there is, that tells you already how far I'm going with Kant and where I part company with him. We are not creating values in that regard. We are guided by them or by what we can see to the best of our ability is the point of things. I may think this is a good idea, it may turn out to be poisonous, but we are trying our best to identify what has a valid point, what is worth doing, and we do it in that way. That doesn't mean that we find the values kind of as a pie in the sky, that they are independent of human nature or human needs, they are not. They are things which could, in principle, contribute to the life of people who can uh, engage in them, enjoy them, in, get involved in them. And that is a, a very strong constraint on what can be valuable. And you notice that I'm not talking about liberty, equality, and fraternity when I'm talking about values. I'm talking about the fresh taste of water or clearing your throat and things like that. Anything which gives a point, which makes something worthwhile, is just for ease of reference called something which makes the act valuable. And, um, and those values, as I said, do derive from our nature as a as a human species, and from what can play a role in that nature, what can bring to fruition abilities, capacities that we have because of the sort of animals that we are, how they can be developed, and uh, how ca they can be developed. The frontiers are always pushed forward because we are developing them against the culture which already developed them and which poses us with new challenges, with new opportunities of developing them still further. Now, I want to talk about autonomy. And uh, the first thing that I want to say is that um, the autonomy that I discuss in the morality of freedom, as is clear in the book, is an ideal which is good for a time and a period, basically to industrial and post-industrial cultures. And this is because in the nature of the economy, and I'm not going to go into that story because it will take too long, uh, the, the nature of the, of the economy, the nature of the technologies that we use have changed the nature of options which we face. We regard them as the same options, we call them by the same names, as we used to sometimes, but as a generality of thing, we talk about friendships, and we talk about uh, occupation, and we talk about lots of other things. But their character has changed because in the post-industrial period, we are 
expected to come to them through a choice among alternatives. We are no longer expected to live in the house where our parents lived, to have the occupation that our parents did. Uh, if we are women, we are not uh, expected just to bear children and serve the needs of men. We are expected to find our way in a much more complex cultural and economic structure and technological structure, explore it to the best of our abilities. Of course, a lot is due to luck and circumstance and make choices. And therefore, the meaning of our relationship now depends on the fact that they are chosen. The meaning of our occupations depends on the way they are chosen. And the fact that they are chosen shows also in the fact that we can change them. They are not chosen for life. We, cho we choose them and we can re-choose them. We can change our cho uh, ch choices during life. We can not do so arbitrarily or without constraints, but in principle we can. So the whole structure of options has changed. They become options which are good if they are chosen in the right spirit, with the right understanding, with the right attitude, and are, do no good to people if they are chosen out of coercion, unless they try, after a while stop being coerced and become voluntary. Uh, or in a spirit of hate and resent, resentment, then whatever we choose, however good it would be, would not be valuable, will not serve a valuable role in our life. So it's a world which has changed and, and made autonomy the mark of our success in our life. That is, the condition, I should say, going back to the capacity for the autonomy and the conditions for autonomy, enable us to have a successful life which will be an autonomous life through using those capacities wisely because of the nature of the world that we live in. It's not a dogmatic position. It's hated by lots of uh, theorists, especially liberal theorists. It, it accepts that people had worthwhile lives in other generations that John Stuart Mill was not the first person who had a rewarding life in the history of the world, that so people had, not everyone's managed, but lots of people managed in different ages and in different cultures, regardless of whether they had autonomy or not, to find satisfaction in their life, and that this can happen to some communities today as well, and that things in the future may change in ways which we cannot predict. Now, from the point of view of the individual, to be successful, to have successful and have a rewarding life in that society, he has to have the adequate range of options that you talked about. Because the fact that they are all around us doesn't stop us from blocking access to them by individuals. And most of the social reform over the last couple of hundred of years was by abolishing blockages, by enabling more and more people, different types of people, different races, different religions, different gender, different religious orient uh, sexual orientation, to have as much access to the opportunities that exist in this society as the others, as the other people have. And it was oppression, which was denial of access, which was the social evil and remains the social evil of our time. Um, OK, so let me stop with this. This kind of give you a, a flavor of how I will comment on this. Let me just say on the direct conflict between um, the person who autonomously does evil, as it were, and the one who doesn't. I don't think there is a conflict between us. The fact that a person did not develop the capacity for autonomy 
is there a drawback in that person, whether it is to blame or not is a different issue. The fact that people who did develop the capacity then make bad choices, which we assume, given by what we say that they have the capacity, that capacity they could have avoided, makes their uh, wrongdoing worse than if they did not have the capacity and could not judge it right. So I think there are just different object of choice, not no conflict there. On the rule of law, what are the differences between the views that I uh, developed and expressed yesterday, was it yesterday or the day, whenever it was Saturday, uh, than the older view? One is that the current view is encoded in an idea about the function of government, the essential function of government. Not So the idea is that there are things which are essential to government as government and distinguish between, in my example, between ownership and go power of government. Um, but they are just a framework. Within that, governments can find different courses to develop different policies. Lim means are always limited, so they can't do everything. That idea did not exist earlier. Instead, as you said, the basic idea was that it's capable, that the law should be such that it is capable of guidance. Now, I expressed in my talk some doubts about this as a fundamental idea. But let me add two other uh, problems that I see with it. There is a way in which it is automatic about the law that it is capable of guidance. If it is not capable of guidance, it is not law. But then it's not a virtue to be capable of guidance because it's not a virtue to be law. It has to be good law to be virtuous. But just to be law, just like being a bottle. Okay, it's a bottle. That doesn't make it a good bottle. To be a good bottle, it has to be more than just a bottle. And to be law, it has to be more than just law. It has to be law with some merit to it. And maybe some merits happen to many laws or to all laws, but capacity for guidance in itself, uh, if it's just necessary, it's not uh, sufficient. Okay, we can overcome this hurdle and talk about more in detail that every citizen will be able to find out what is the law which applies to him. These are the Enlightenment ideals about the nature of law which guided the fathers of the American Revolution more than probably any other legal experiments anywhere else in the world. They are not something which we think are realistic in the world today. Most law does not guide us directly. If I want to know what the law is, I go to a lawyer or I go to an official, it doesn't have to be a lawyer, go to some expert and we find out what they are. Those people are highly trained to unravel the complexities of tax law or corporate law or international trade law. The idea that Every one of them, intellectual property, ownership of shares and bond, every aspect of the law would be available to every individual. Well, perhaps it's not impossible. If we think of the life of people as dedicated entirely to learning the law and in all its corners and niches, then maybe each one of us can do this and we will have no life at all. That would be the only thing we have accomplished in life. The, in the reality of the complex legal structures that we live with and which affect everything we do, our salaries, the value of our property, our ch chances in life in many ways, uh, we learn what they are. They are guiding people but they don't, and they guide us 
but they don't guide us directly in that way. In that regard, they might just as well be in a secret law, which was the classical example of a, non, a violation of a rule of law. Secret law is, of course, not secret from everyone. If it were secret from everyone, then it might as well not exist. Uh, it's secret for most of us. Well, most of the law is secret for most of us. We get brief summaries adequate to our current understanding of the nature of law. Another thing is um, strict liability, which is, well, I don't have time to talk about it, but strict liability could be regarded as a great violation of the rule of law. So this is more to people who are lawyers and know what I'm talking about. Uh, strict liability, when you actually examine it, is not uh, such an evil thing. It can be good, it can be bad. Again, it depends on the circumstances, but it plays a fairly vital role in the administration of justice. And indeed, it, elements of strict liability exist in negligence law. This is another big story. But uh, it's another reason why the capacity for guidance in a simple-minded way will not do and why I have replaced it with a core idea of the, uh, an understanding of the function of government which leads to a more um, complex picture. Um, another change which is in a way a result of this is that I don't believe in a number of principles that can be enumerated and begotten, you know, then, then we know everything there is to the rule of law. And the uh, point that you highlighted in your presentation, that it, it has presumptions and so on, means that there is endless. But there could be others which are not only in the way of presumption. Uh, so the, the picture seems to me necessarily more complex. And uh, I try to do some justice to that com complexity. And it goes beyond the avoidance of arbitrary government. By the way, the quotation from, government, from Dworkin does not meet the point about avoiding arbitrary government. Arbitrary, arbitrariness general, generally is carelessness, indifference to what the reasons which apply to the action are when there are reasons which apply to the action. So when there are no reasons, you toss the coin, that's fine. But when you are reasons, and instead of asking yourself, what are they? You say, oh, I can't be bothered, I will just do something. Then you are arbitrary, reacting arbitrary. Obeying the law doesn't mean that it's not arbitrary. You have to establish that, uh, that there is reason to obey the law. And sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. Um, okay, so, but the, the, my point was that you don't stop with arbitrariness. You have to go to beyond it, but what I call the manifest intention to try to do what governments ought to do, namely serve the interests of the government. So I, I just, in reply, in this case, in, in your case, it wasn't a reply, it was just footnotes to what you said, but here in, in reply, I explain why my first article was much worse than you think it was. So, uh, the forum will end at three, uh, four o'clock. We still have 50 minutes more. Uh, I know a lot of uh, uh, scholars in philosophy, legal or political, and also students here. Uh, it's, it's a precious time here to discuss with uh, directly with the Tom Price Laureate. Please raise your hand. Um, okay, uh, nice to meet you, Professor Joseph Ratz. Um, I'm a student from the University of Glasgow, yeah, but I'm currently in Taiwan. Um, I would like to know your opinion about the humankind as a whole, because that is a concept we usually talk about. So do you think uh, humankind as a whole could be a group? And 
a humankind as a whole could um, have some um, a kind of collective interest in justifying other subgroups or state um, their duties to uh, correspond to duties. That is my question. Thank you. I think that um, each individual has moral interest to, just to use this term, namely uh, that it is in each individual interest to behave properly, to uh, discharge his moral duties, and, and so on. Um, This is relevant to this is relevant to reflection on the role of government because some people might think that in serving the interests of the people the duty of government is to make them richer, more economically more comfortable. But that's not the view that I hold. The role is to serve their interests, including their moral interests. And I, I think this is part of what you have in mind. Uh, but you are asking whether there are collective interests in justifying duties. Uh, and whether humankind as a whole is a group. I don't think that humankind as a whole is a group, uh, but um, I'm not even sure about individual interests in justifying duties, either one's, one's own or others. That is, you have an interest in being morally proper and behaving more morally towards yourself and towards others. Uh, but you don't have a duty to be a philosopher and engage in justification. You can find out what is demanded, what morality demands of you without knowing the justification. In fact, I think that's the only way I know what morality demands of me. I have quite a lot of views about what morality demands of me. And ask me how to justify them, I will be nonplussed in most cases. Uh, so how do, why do I think that those are sensible views? Well, there are ways of uh, establishing them, uh, establishing this. Some of them have Build, build elements and the justification. You can point to things how, you know, how um, they contribute to other people. For example, you don't have a duty to another person if he doesn't contribute to the person we are talking about. So we can, we can do elements in the justification, but ultimately we, uh, we, are not very good at doing philosophy, and this is too much to acquire. There are, there are views, there are views of people who have uh, developed. So justification, so you may be convinced that Kant had the justification, and you may have reason to think that Kant got it right, so you believe in the conclusion that he came to, it doesn't follow that you can follow his arguments, right? I mean, it's ask yourself how you know any, any scientific truth unless you are a scientist yourself, right? In all of those cases, you know it because you have reason to believe that some people know the truth and you know what they believe to be the truth and you accept it, but you don't know what their evidence is. You cannot repeat it and explain it. So I don't think that that is uh, such an important thing to do. Again, 
We don't want to spend all our life justifying our views. We want to have a life. Is this an answer? I don't know. Two questions here. One is written in English, uh, proposed by uh, another postgraduate from Zheng Zidaxue, Xiong, Mr. Xiong. Maybe you can pre present your questions on your own. Where is Mr. Xiong? And another is uh, by a sophomore student, uh, Tre Cheng Zhang. Uh, he writes his uh, question in Chinese, and uh, there are four questions in total. Um, my name is uh, My name is Xiong Tingzi, uh, and my question is. Um, a simple but yet quite difficult one for me. Um, is, it a, is it a proper understanding to separate your uh, legal philosophy and political philosophy? Um, is it possible uh, for one to accept or um, accept your point of view in legal philosophy? such as um, the service conception of, of authority, yet he um, don't support or dis disencourage your ideology in political philosophy. Is it, is it, <laughs> is it sound or is it incapable in your point of view? That's my question. Thank you. You said more of the difficulties that you feel because you point to a view which you say is a view in legal philosophy and to another view which is the which is a view in political philosophy and how can they be Reconciled. Well, why should they be reconciled? There is no tension between them. It's like, suppose you had a, some result in physics and some result in chemistry, so you just have two results. Uh, there might be conflict between them, but it wouldn't automatically follow that there is. So the division of, of the two philosophies, legal philosophy and political philosophy, is just to indicate very loosely drawn uh, lines of inquiry. And some people are more interested or in questions that are studied. And some people are more focused on one range of question. Other people are focused on the other range of questions, I happen not the only one who works on both, but there's no, that's all it means. It's uh, just two different findings and you just, you got double your money as it were. You've got two answers to two questions. Unless there is some specific problem, which sometimes there would be, but sometimes would be between two views in legal philosophy and two views in political philosophy, there might be problems. Uh, then they have to be pointed out and explored specifically. You mentioned some theses, the legal political separation theses, but I don't know about it, so this is news to me. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Uh, Professor Wright. And actually, I ask four questions, but however, I think two of my questions is more important. Uh, first, uh, according to M Professor Dai, you think you are an me is supposed to be per in pursuit of good things. However, for every reasonable person, we have different backgrounds from families, from schools, from teachers, from educations. Then how can we, or how can law itself balance these kind of disputes between the difference of the background that every reasonable person has. 
And the second question is that uh, we know that we are living in a very fast changing world right now, a very fast changing society. And how can law react to the human beings' uh, request or human beings' need in future? In the future, how can law itself do some response or do reactions to that? Uh, these two are my questions. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Okay, so let's take the first question. Um, we can start with my analogies with science and then ask why is it different. Okay. So don't think that I think it is like science, but we can start there. So scientists come from different backgrounds. Science is the most international language, I think, in the world. It seems that background doesn't stop scientists from talking to each other and with agreeing, not that there aren't any disputes, there are raging disputes, but they, and arguably, background plays some role in them, at least some feminist thesis would suggest that in about at least some cases. But generally speaking, uh, they do not align with the uh, background, the disputes that exist in science. So why don't they, why can we overcome, do they have to overcome the diverse backgrounds to reach a common understanding? Well, yes. Uh, they all, I, I'll put a bet that unless they are children of scientists, they all change their understanding of nature quite remarkably through their work as scientists. Uh, but they did this in spite of their background. Okay, so we have a proven, if that is a proof, a proven capacity in human beings to explore the truth in areas where initially you are influenced by your background, but we have the capacity to transcend that background in response to evidence, to argument, broadly understood. What, could it be said that it stands, should stand in good stead when it comes to moral disputes or political disputes? Um, yes and no, there are similarities and there are differences. They are amenable to evidence, they are amenable to reason, and there are examples of people who did that, who completely changed their original views from derived from their upbringing in education and uh, adopted completely different views. I'm not saying better views, but different views. So they are not, they are not prisoners of their background. And they adopt them, again, this is not obvious, maybe some non-rational factors work on them later, but we will find cases where we could say fairly convincingly that they changed in response to their understanding in light of reasoning and evidence. But that doesn't mean that it's the same, right? It just means that there are elements of similarity. There are perhaps elements of difference. One of them might be that people's, something deep in people is tied up with their uh, initial views about morality and things of that kind, values generally. Uh, so that changing them has an undermining effect, might seem threatening in a variety of ways. Um, threatening 
their views about the nature of interpersonal relationship might seem threatening to them, undermining their sexual self-confidence or undermining their self-confidence in negotiating social relations. They no longer understand how to do it because now it turns out that it can be done in completely different ways than they understood before. So it's threatening in, in that way. Um, there are a variety of ways which we can analyze which would suggest that the difficulties are greater. But so far, I'm regarding them as difficulties. And so long as they are regarded as difficulties, there might be a way to overcome them. All you have to realize is that it is a difficulty. And then you know that you have to overcome it. Uh, you might not be able to, but you are halfway there already by the very fact that you regard it as a difficulty and you understand the nature of the difficulty at least a little bit. And that's one way progress, to illuminate the nature of the difficulties, to, to explain how we are undermined, feel threatened when our views are challenged. It's not to be taken lightly that these are dif uh, difficulties. People might say, no, these are factors which are self-verifying because we or other people believe like that, it is like that, right? So that things which you, this guy, says are difficulties are in fact no difficulties. They just point to the fact that there is irreconcilable, irreconcilable diversity and that truth is relative. Everyone is right, but everyone is right in his own light and there is no other truth. There's no, I don't know, objective truth. Okay, that's a possibility. Well, it's actually an impossibility. Um, so the, once you start looking into it, you find yourself that quite easy to do, entangled in contradictions and confusions. And the way people react is just by saying, go away, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Which is weakness, which confirms the idea that there are, these are difficulties which stop us from seeing the truth. And we have to fight them and overcome them. But it's not altogether, in a, in a more modest way, there is a degree of self-verifying in uh, cultural conventions or cultural products. They create things of value, cultures creating them. Most of the things that we value are cultural products. Even the things which have to do with our biological needs for adequate temperature, for food, for water, for sex, things like that, are the way we actually lead our lives. They are all culturally modified. Otherwise, we will all have the same diet. But I can tell you that what I eat in Taipei is not when, what I normally eat in New York. It's very different. <laughs> so. We know that even the most fundamental elements of our uh, values, those which are dictated, well, bound up with our uh, biological nature, are valued in a way which is culturally modified. And come to think of it, there's nothing wrong in that. There's nothing wrong in the fact that our food or our music or something like that, is a product of our culture. And people who are not of our culture have a deaf ear to our music, can't understand it, can't respond to it, or don't like our food or something else. We can remain confident in the value of our cultural product. But we should remember that if that is true, they 
their cultural products are also valuable. We might not enjoy them, we might not want to participate in them, but we should respect them. We should not denigrate them. So that's a way of transcendence, and that wouldn't involve you in contradiction. There will be a question of the limits, how far uh, the moral morality allows for cultural var variation, and when a culture becomes oppressive. But that's a different question. So these are some thoughts about how we can do it. About the future, goodness me. Uh, we cannot but speculate. It's not only that the changes are fast. The direction has not been predictable. There are uh, changes which, not cultural changes or technological changes, but changing like climate change whose direction is predictable. So there are those. And we can think scientifically about how to counter them. And some people do, and other people try to stop them from doing it. Uh, but that can be done. But, but the, impact, the cultural impact, like of the search, people talk a lot about social media these days, and the way they affect social relations um, and other aspects of, of life in, in a quite deep way, surprisingly much deeper than 10 years ago people would have thought. Uh, this, this was unpredictable and the way it happens and what it does is unpredictable and not fully understood because it's quite complex. So all we can do is to try and speculate and keep our speculations broad so the more specific they are, the more likely we are to be wrong and think of what we can do to meet those needs of the future before they arise. But I'm afraid that on the whole we will keep chasing them after they arise. I have a question raised by Dr. Wu from Tsinghua University, uh, Faculty of Chinese Literature, uh, a question on authority of law. Please, uh, is Dr. Wu here present? 呃，我想请问的问题是，因为我我自己研究的领域是古代中国 ，early early China. So my question is, does law have to establish its own authority that is transcendent or at least at least independent, or the law doesn't need to have any authority to make people obey or uh, or or having his power, and that's its val value. Thank you, that's my question. Thank you very much for explaining this to me. Um, I can only speak for, for about what I know, um, and I so I can't speak about uh, traditions which I'm unfamiliar with. Uh, but I have no reason to think that what I say would be alien to them. So I'm, I'm just not going to address it. But the, the authority of law is a human authority. The, when, sorry, I should say the authority of law when the law has authority, which is not necessarily always the case. But it's, a, it's an authority of human organizations, institutions, but institutions and organizations which are run by human beings over themselves, but over other human beings, over other institutions, but also over other human beings. And the question is, that authority is presented as binding on certain people. It's not advice. It's not telling them, you know, you will, your health will go better if you do this or that, or your friendship with this friend, which is now troubled, 
will go better if you do this and this. They tell you what to do. And they threaten sometimes, quite often, with dire consequences if you don't do as you are told. So the question is quite severe. How could it be that what some human beings can have that authority over other human beings? So my thought about it is that it is an, a case, maybe a more radical case, but a case of something we are familiar with in which people get other people or sometimes mechanical devices, machines, to decide for themselves. Right, so I w may appoint someone to decide for myself on some issues. He will be, he will represent me, and with a limited scope of authority, but within that range of authority, his decision will bind me. This is very familiar, and we also use machines for that purpose. We give up on decision ourselves and consign them to computers and so on. Why? Well, people say because you agreed to them, but you didn't agree to the authority. I don't think it's because we agree to them. That's never a sufficient answer because we can agree to all sorts of stupid things. And we are not bound by all our stupid agreements. Uh, I think the fundamental answer is because that way our interests are served better. My interests are served by my keeping control of our life in a whole range of issues, but there are some issues where my interests will be served better if somebody else took control over my affairs, say, in investment, banking, and things like that. Uh, I don't understand anything about this. I would rather have somebody who is an expert in investment give him my savings and tell him to protect it from deterioration. And his decision will bind me. So this. This is a good decision if it really does serve my interests. And with regard to the law, I think it's the same thing. The law has authority to the extent that it is minding our interests and telling us to do things which are, it is in our interest to do. And to the extent that it does so better than we could do ourselves, right? So the law should, shouldn't have too much right to tell us what to do. Only when it does so in ways which are better than we could do ourselves and which do not intrude into various spheres of our life where it is fundamentally important that we should decide for ourselves even if we are not deciding very wisely. There are certain areas in life where we think it's absolutely vital. In choice of friends, for example, we think it is important that I will choose my friends even though I'm notoriously a bad chooser of friends. And two months later, I regret that I am friends with this person and move away. Uh, it's still important that I should do it rather than somebody else will do it for me. But in many areas of life, this is not so. So it's important that the law should be confined to those areas which are not, not impinge on the personnel, let's call it, where it is fundamental that I should decide for myself, and that what it does in the other areas will be in my interest in a way which is better than what I can do myself. Very often this is this, the case, 
because it relies on coordination of behavior of groups of people, of all of, all of us, or groups of citizens, to achieve results like orderly transport system, which we cannot achieve individually, each one doing, acting on his own, it will be chaos. Right, this is controversial, but I believe in the end this is true. Right, it will be chaos if each one decided on transportation systems. Individually, it's good that somebody takes a hand in this in a way which coordinate all of us and creates an effective transportation system. So uh, we can see how in certain areas, we can explain how in certain areas the law can do things which we cannot do ourselves and in those uh, and which are, do not invade in our in the personal sphere, and that's the realm of its authority. Roughly speaking. Yeah, please. Um, thank you, Professor Barat. Yes, it's so nice to having you in Taiwan. So I'm Hong Wu Chen from Academic Seneca. Um, I guess my question is like the, the relationship between autonomy and the coercion. So um, between autonomy and the coercion. So it's, um, the, the question is like this. So um, is it possible for the government to legitimately intervene someone's autonomous decision when someone, this person, sincerely believes such decision is very important to him or to her. Let me take one example, like the regulation of, of fake news. It's a very hot topic in the world right now. So it seems like both reason for and against such regulations exists. So on the one hand, if we take the content of speech as a kind of good, so the government's job is to secure such content is true, right? But on the other hand, um, we might respect the government can protect some kind of autonomous, autonomous sphere for people when they think, okay, I want to circulate such information, even when I'm not sure whether such information is true or not. So um, I guess that's my question about the relationship between autonomy and the coercion. Thank you. Thank you. You, you understand it. You understand coercion, apparently, in, in a very um, wide way. Um, in the case of regulation of information, we are not coerced. The people who are coerced are people who aim to s supply information, let's call it, and uh, if they break the law, they will be put in jail or lose property and so on. So at that point, when they break the law, they will be coerced. But the coercion is not upon us. I, I believe, however, that you care about us rather than about the providers of information. And now, so, so this is a different, slightly different problem. And also, I think that the, generally the problem there does not presuppose a strong emphasis on, co on autonomy. You don't have, the, in other words, you don't need to agree with anything I said about autonomy to see the problem in the situation that you mentioned. Um, okay, so the, there are several, it's a complex issue, obviously there are several dimensions to it. One of them is to uh, what to do about people who, the consumers of information, I don't know whether we should call it information, pretend information maybe it's a better term, because information assumes that it is true. Uh, would, some people are not able to assess that, and that's a problem. That's basically a, an educational problem. It should be the case that people who are at the age of 14, 15, 
are able to assess information, not perfectly, nobody can assess information perfectly. One of the most famous historians in England believed that something is secret diaries of, of Hitler when they were a piece of fabrication. So he fell for it. So everyone can be misguided. Um, but have, having a fairly competent ability to judge requires a decent education. If you don't have it, you have problems and there's no other way of solving them. Um, beyond that, there's primarily a different, not of stopping some purported information from reaching people's ears or eyes, but stopping it from reaching people's ears or eyes in a, a manipulative way. One of them is by swamping any other information. Uh, by being more glitzy and, you know, sort of having more money so that it, you can't open your eyes without getting it, whereas other information you have to spend uh, $10 or more to, to get a glimpse of and so on. Um, so, so it's a matter of regulation rather than, to my mind, rather than a matter of straight coercion. Coercion will exist there because regulation will be compulsory and people who will violate the rules will be punished. But uh, a, a wise regulation could do it without interfering with people's access to all sorts of views, including stupid views, and their ability to make up their minds for themselves. Uh. I see no questions and no question here. May I personally add three really stupid questions to you at the, the end of the forum? And uh, the first one is I noticed that um, you have uh, in your laureate lecture uh, explicitly deferred with uh, people like uh, uh, Bingham, uh, that uh, while he postulates that the rule of law should include that uh, fundamental rights being protected by the state. And uh, in, in Taiwan, the old liberals uh, have begun with the, the dichotomy of uh, rule of law and rule by law. Uh, for rule by law mean exactly that uh, no fundamental protection, fundamental rights protection. And I notice that uh, this is also shared by many uh, Western liberals like Tom Ginsburg, who had written a book about uh, rule by law uh, and has collected as a con con comparative constitutionalist uh, the, the, the practice of these countries. And also heard that uh, your work on legal uh, positivism is quite appreciated in China uh, because they think uh, it is good that uh, if we don't have uh, fundamental rights protection, we have at least rule by law, so it's own virtue. Do you agree with this? difference of uh, rule of law and rule by law. And the second question is, uh, is already mentioned by Professor Xie about transitional justice, which is uh, debated, also discussed here in Taiwan right now. Uh, uh, is, is somehow it seems not quite compatible with your postulation of rule of law that the laws should all be prospective instead of retroactive. And we also remind the, the, the famous debate in the, uh, for 60 years ago between Hart and Fuller about uh, uh, transitional justice. Uh, do you think there's any compromise between the two, uh, traditional, uh, transitional justice and, and uh, the, the, the 
prohibition of retroactive law. And a third question is uh, about the difference between rule of law and Rechtsstaat, uh, the, the German wording of rule of law. Uh, I, wrote, I read uh, a paper by uh, Michelle Rosenfeld, uh, a New Yorker, a New York uh, comparative lawyer, a uh, constitutional lawyer, and he, he, he meant uh, there's a great difference between the continental Rechtsstaat and the rule of law. Uh, in a sense, uh, there, there are many aspects. For example, one is very systematic thinking, the other is topical way of legal thinking. And, and one is based on the proposition of limited government. Uh, the government is bound by law only when the people will have the law. But the other, in, in, con in, in old continent, where law should be rational, it is uh, the expression of the will of the state. Uh, do you agree with his idea of the dichotomy? Of, uh, he, as he said, the Reichstag should be translated as rule through law instead of rule of law. So uh, <clears throat> let me start with the last one because it's the easiest. Uh, I can say I agree. I am delighted that Michel thinks that way. I didn't know about that. Um, because too many colleagues and writers have said, you know, Reichstag is the rule of law and the other way around. Um, and it seems to me, without knowing the German tradition, uh, German legal tradition, that that's extremely unlikely. Uh, but because I'm not an expert, I, I didn't pronounce them there. So I'm glad that we know <laughs> that it is not the same. Um, <clears throat> Um, the first question, I think, um, not the question, but the, the views of some people you mentioned by name are bred by confusion. Of course, human rights should be protected by law and they should be protected by uh, a legal system which observes the rule of law. It's much more likely that it will do so than a legal system which does not. There's no problem about this. Um, traffic, the, the, efficiency of the traffic system should be protected by law and is much more likely to be protected by a, a legal system which observes the rule of law than by one which does not. Because you remember, the rule of a legal system which observes the rule of law will, be, uh, will not have arbitrary use of power and it's much more likely that a legal system without arbitrary use of power will protect traffic regulation, a decent traffic system, than one which has arbitrary power. And similarly with regard to human rights. Now, you might say you, observing human rights is more important than having an efficient traffic system, and that's why people more often say that the rule of law or the law observing the rule of law should protect human rights, but that's maybe, that's okay. Um, everything that the law should do, it should do in a legal system which observes the rule of law and is much more likely to do it properly when it does observe the rule of laws than if it doesn't. And moreover, you find that point made repeatedly in international documents. 
they call again and again and again and again for the rule of law to defend human rights, for the rule of law to defend democracy, for the rule of law to defend freedom and other goodies that the law should protect. And they require the rule of law to defend them, as of course it should. No problem there. The confusion arises when people, including famous scholars or judges, like Lord Bingham, um, somehow got the idea that human rights are part of the rule of law rather than something which is protected by the rule of law. He also had the idea that uh, observing international treaties is part of the rule of law, even though not only something which should be protected by the rule of law, that is not even popular in international document. <laughs> I don't know how he got it. So it's, it's a simple confusion of mind between what the rule of law should secure for us and what the rule of law is. Natural justice. Uh, tr sorry, transitional justice. Um, as, as we know all too well, it's a multifaceted problem. Uh, so on the one hand, there is the punitive side of it. Uh, whether people who are complicit with certain activities of the now removed oppressive past regime should be penalized. There is a restorative side to it, whether some transactions, especially property confiscation and so on, by the previous regime should be reversed and that poverty should be restored to the people who were its owners. And if so, how far does it go? Does a forced fire sale constitute as bad as, as, a, as confiscation and should be reversed as well? These are difficult issues. And, but another one, another, another aspect is of competence to serve our people who are in some way tainted by um, having done well under the previous regime, cooperated with the previous regime, actually having been particularly active in the previous regime or supported its ideology even without serving in any official capacity. Should they be entitled to sit on our courts, to serve in parliament, to teach in universities, to run major institutions today? These are quite different questions. And beyond them, there are other, no doubt, ones which do not come to my mind at the moment. Beyond them, there are questions of how are we to face each other? Are we to turn to the other side of the street when we see someone about whom we have no proof that he was against the previous regime? Are we to, to cross to the other side of the street to avoid someone who performed some functions within the previous regime, for example, conducted marriages and tested to wheels and so on. When, how, how are we to face each other? And how are we to live together? What do we do within families? What do we do? Uh, usually a problem for young people regarding the older generation in their family. Um, there are much greater questions, much more difficult questions then questions about the rule of law. The rule of law becomes involved in them in a marginal way in some aspects of some of them. Obviously the punitive and some aspects of the 
restorative issues. But most of the, of the <coughs> questions of tra transitional justice are not solved nor hindered, neither aided nor hindered by any, any thought about the rule of law. They are just different moral questions. And that would be, for example, rele relevant to one of the earlier questions, issues where a, a social consensus uh, coming together around a way of dealing with a problem could be quite helpful. Actually, up, but I think uh, two discussants maybe want to know some re further discussions or rebuttals. Okay, uh, it's uh, five minutes after four. I think we have to call it an end. Uh, you uh, all enjoy uh, this wonderful speech, this replies uh, <coughs> to many problems of rule of law. Uh, maybe we should uh, give a uh, warmest applause to this great laureate, laureate of Tom Price in rule of law again, and to thank you for your time. And I don't know if there is any contractual obligation for you to come to visit us again, but at least you're hardly, oh, hardly welcome to come to visit us again. Please. Thank you. Thank you to all of our distinguished guests for sharing such marvelous point of views. Please stay on the stage momentarily so we can have a group photo together. <laughs>